Hey, what's up everyone? Tetrick85 here, and today I'm going to be talking about Episode 3 of Book 4 of Legend of Korra, titled The Korra Nation. As you probably expect, that, that this episode is mainly the focus of the coronation of Prince, Prince Wu being the, uh, coronated into the Earth King. But there's actually two, there's actually two talking points that I want to discuss here. And one of them is the coronation itself, but the first one I want to talk about is uh, what's going on with Korra and her encounter with Toph in the swamp. And like I talked about last time, I was uh, hoping that Toph would be almost like a mentor to her, to Korra, try to get her make stronger. And for the most part in that, she did. She was pretty much um, Korra's teacher, but... Uh, Right off the bat, you know, due to Toph and her unorthodox ways of teaching, as we saw in uh, the original series when she taught Aang, her, um, her um, talking with Korra isn't exactly what you call upbeat, you know, because uh, right off the bat, she tells Korra that uh, the, av she, the world doesn't really need the Avatar, which, uh, as one would expect, Korra gets kind of irked about that, which um, her Korra responded by... Um, saying about all the evil people in that, that she, uh, helped defeat and then make the world a better place. And she also, uh, managed to compare Toph to Chief Bayfong, which Toph reminded her that she was the original Bayfong, which, uh, <laughs> not to sound too much like a fanboy, but you can tell that even at 86 years of age, Toph has not changed one bit, because she's still spunky and feisty, and a strong individual is she, what she's always been, and it's really awesome to see that. And um, and you could tell by the way she talks to Cora now and behaves around Cora that, hey, she, I'm the one that's in charge, and that you listen to me. I'm trying to teach you, and that. So, um, which despite her being uh, sounding negative towards Cora, saying that the world doesn't need an avatar, that she really is trying to teach Cora a lesson. Which Toph pretty much gives an example of herself when she was chief of police. She said that uh, she brought down a whole bunch of criminals, but at the same time, crime didn't disappear. So she said the names may change, but the streets uh, are going to stay the same in that. Which, uh, like I said before, Cora didn't really like that in that. But uh, despite this, Cora really wants uh, Toph to help her out and try to get out of this current funk that she's in, which... Uh, Toph finally agrees in that, which Cora tries to give her a hug about it, but Toph puts an earth wall on her, saying, Hey, if you want to hug someone, hug a tree. <laughs> oh, I, it's like I said before, I, I just I just love her feistiness in that, in which uh, you'll see her trying to tough um, Cora up, like Cora was trying to fight against Toph in that, but no matter what she did, Toph always managed to get the upper hand in that, and, and Toph, being the character that she is, she, is, she just... Loved every minute of it and ate being able to put Cora down like herd candy and that. Pretty much like she did on uh, that episode, Better Work on Avatar The Last for Airbender. You could tell where she was kind of enjoying herself a little bit, tormenting Aang, which back then she was trying to teach Aang important lessons too, which uh, Cora will find out soon enough that Toph does mean well. It's just, you know, but her, her teaching in an unorthodox manner and that. It may come across as being crass, but Toph means well with her teachings and that, which, uh... But yeah, T Toph, no, ma no matter what Cora tried to do and that, she just couldn't get the upper hand on Toph. And, um, here she goes, uh, Cora um, commented by saying, well, she thought that uh, Toph was going to do this, and Toph replied by saying, well, that's what your problem is, you're spending too much time thinking. So, um, here, Cora tried to get a shot on her while Toph wasn't looking, but being the earthbending master that she is, Toph saw this immediately and knocked Cora down again. <laughs> so, um, Cora was getting really frustrated and really wanted Toph to get down to the roots of what's going on with her, and Toph simply said that, uh, she still has a little bit of metal in her, the, the liquid mercury from when the hair poisoned her. To Cora's amazement, she replied by saying, I thought Sue took all the poison out of him, out of me, so, and which I find interesting because, um, Toph made a comment saying that, uh, neither one of her daughters were quite as attuned to metal bending as what they'd like. 
And I find this intriguing considering I think Sue and Lynn are awesome metal benders. And for her to have to say that, you know, if, if, if it goes to show, that might be a, like, a sign as how good Toph has gone during the 86 years of her life. If, if Sue and Lynn are awesome with their uh, metal bending abilities, imagine how good Toph is with that. I, I just hope we get to see some of that metal bending prowess. After all, she was, Toph is the one that discovered metal bending, which, notice I said discovered or not create. You really don't create bending abilities unless you're a lion turtle, but... But yeah, Korra begs her to try to get the poison out of her, which Toph agrees, but... Every time Toph, uh, Toph went to get the poison out of her, Toph's, uh, I mean, Korra fought against it and that uncontrollably and that, and, um... At this point, Toph got really frustrated and told Korra that she didn't want the poison taken out of her, and... Korra kind of looks at her like, what do you mean? And here, that's when Toph says, comes to a conclusion that uh, Korra is using the poisoning as an excuse to get away from being the Avatar and that. And Korra, door, uh, Korra is disappointed by this, and Toph feels like there's nothing much she can do, so she recommends that Korra sees the, the spirit that brought her to Toph and then see what she's able to do. Then maybe she'll be able to be healed spiritually because... Both of them are really frustrated at this point, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the next episode regarding this, because um, I really do think Toph was really trying to help Korra out, and, and I think Korra was trying to do her best in that, but at the same time, it's whatever is going on with her body that's preventing her from getting over this uh, block that she has of not being able to go to the Avatar State and not being as strong as she was, so... Um, but the the second talking point I'm, I should talk about is the coronation of Prince Wu, which, even after the end of this episode, I don't like Prince Wu. I just think he's too much of a uh, one-dimensional character, even more so than Marco, which is saying something, because I think Marco is the most one-dimensional of the Team Avatar. But having said that, though, at least... Throughout the books, you can tell Marco kind of has a little bit of a personality in that, but uh, if you compare compare him to Prince Wu, Prince Wu just seems like a really shallow person, in which Marco tried to get him to realize this later on in the episode. But um, but yeah, things were supposed to go smoothly in that, where Wu was supposed to be coronated as the Earth King in that, in that which didn't go according to Wu's plans because most of the artifacts were stolen from the, um, the liberation of Bossing Sei by Zaheer and that, so the only thing he was able to get was a royal brooch to put on him, letting the people know that, uh, that he's gonna be the Earth King and that, which, um, here everything was supposed to be where he was supposed to be a coronated Earth King and he's supposed to have a, uh, a committee and that helping him rule the Earth Kingdom, but Kuvira just wanted to speak and which Wu let her, but, uh, Come to realize that Kuvira is not going to relinquish her power in the Earth Kingdom. As a matter of fact, she declares that the Earth Kingdom is no more. And that uh, she is going to begin an Earth Empire. Which, if anybody tries to go in the borders or tries to mess with Earth Empire affairs, that she will crush them without question. So, um... But yeah, it, it took everybody uh, to surprise and that she was able to go against everybody's, most people's wishes in that, which the audience seemed to like the idea of Kavira doing that, but, uh, it makes me wonder, though, you know, how can she do that, and how can the United Nations, the United Republic, allow that to happen? You know, think they have, like, a council on that. You think they'd prevent matters like this, where they try to prevent a military dictatorship like this, but, um, but, yeah, it's, um, not only, and this is, it causes a lot of problems in that. And first problem I should talk about is with Marco and Bolin. Marco is Princess, is Prince Wu's bodyguard, while Bolin is pretty much Kuvira's right hand man. And at one point in the episode, they meet each other in that, and they get in a little bit of a fight in that. Bolin tries to make the case for Kuvira and how she's trying to help the Earth Kingdom in that, but, and, um, uh, Marco rebut rebuts by saying, you know, how can, yeah, she might have brought st stability in there, but is the military, military dictatorship gonna work, which, 
I was kind of surprised by what Bolin said because he really cut down Marco, which I thought was really unlike Bolin. And then he pretty much told Marco to bow down and kiss Princess Wu's shoes and that. And I thought that was really off character to Bolin, so I was kind of surprised to see him stand up to Marco like that. And of course, Prince Wu, in his own weird way, tries to console Marco, but it ends up not working out. So. Another relationship that's, a str that's strained by this whole situation with the Earth Kingdom is the one between Batara Jr. and his mom, Sue. And, um, they get to meet in that, and you can tell they've been estranged in that. There is a bit of coldness that they have towards each other. Batara Jr. tries to reason with her, saying that, despite her not liking Kuvir, that Kuvir is trying to save the Earth Kingdom and that, but, uh, of course, Sue being the, the woman that she is and that, she is not really fond of world leaders having too much control in that, and she sees Kavir as almost being like another version of the Earth, King, Earth Queen, and she tries to tell Batara that the path that Kavir is taking the Earth Kingdom is not going to work, but uh, Batara pretty much shrugged her off on that, and he also pretty much told Sue that he she might as well accept that uh, not only is Kuvira going to be the new leader of the Earth Empire, that she's going to have to get used to her being a, a permanent member of the family because he is engaged to Kuvira. So, um, but yeah, that, that rift didn't get resolved, and I don't see it getting resolved anytime soon unless uh, something happens with Kuvira and that and someone's able to stop her tyranny, which is pretty much what it is. It's like I said before, you know, what Kavira is doing is exactly what Zaheer was trying to warn the world against, which, like I said before, you know, what he did was wrong, and at the same time, he was trying to make a point. And, uh, obviously, Kavira didn't take it to heart, and from what it looks like, she may be destined to meet the same fate as the Earth Queen, but we don't know for sure about that, and, um, even the relationship with Kuvira and Sue has been strained, obviously, because Sue doesn't agree with Kuvira's political actions and that, which I think is kind of sad in a way, because the Kuvira did spend that time in Zalfu with Sue and that. She was one of her metal dancers and that, and um, they did seem to be good friends, but now you can clearly see where they don't meet eye to eye, and... Um, Sue tried to reason with Kuvira, saying, you know, it's best for her to step down and that, and Kuvira rebuts by saying that she needed to step up because if she didn't st stand up, then um, there's going to be bandits running all over the place and that, and, uh, and Sue kept on rebutting in that, and even Kuvira try uh, even threatened Sue by saying, you know what, the... you're not even going to imagine what I'd be able to do with Zalfu if I was in there, which, uh, I'm going to be honest with you, if that does come to that, it's going to be interesting to see what happens there, because I don't think Sue's going to let Kuvira take Zalfu without a fight, because she's very passionate about the city that she built and that, so, um, but yeah, there's going to be, there's a lot of character development going on here, and, um, at the very end of the episode, we see Kuvira now talking to Verk, which Verk appears to hold a piece of vine from, uh, Republic City. And Kuvir asked him to uh, make renovative te technology based off the vine and that, which she didn't say vine, but obviously that's what she was alluding to there. So uh, I think that pretty much sets the stage for the next episode and that. So, um, and a small thing I do want to mention before I end this and that is that it was cool seeing Eska and Desna again. Of course, uh, Eska was talking to Bolin and that, and she confused. Kuvira is being his new girlfriend, which Bolin tells her that she's his boss, and Eska replies, boss, girlfriend, whatever, <laughs> and her own monotone manner, but, uh, yeah, it's it's nice, I have nothing against Eska and Desna, so it was nice seeing them again, so, um, but yeah, it's gonna be interesting, um, like I said uh, a couple minutes ago, the character development is starting to get really intriguing, the storylines are getting intriguing. I just can't wait to see what the next episode holds in that, because see what ha happens with Cora, whether she's able to snap out of the funk, what's going to happen with Maka and Bolin's relationships, and what's going to happen with Sue and her family and that, and, that, and But yeah, that's pretty much it I have to talk about in this episode, so thank you for listening for this blog, and tune in next week when I talk about episode 4, The Calling.